Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco, and coming up, news about whose knives, a new finch in the nest, and a survey of slip joint patterns. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for joining me. Um, well, in a new tradition, I'm going to uh, have a little dad joke of the week. Uh, and, and to sort of start this thing off, I'm going to start with a, a very daddish uh, sort of image, which is, man, I love my furniture. Me and my recliner go way back. Pretty good, huh? I'm going to check that one off. Look, I have a book of 600 plus of these that I got for my birthday from my kids. So uh, they asked for it. So therefore, um, you asked for it. Uh, my favorite comment of the week, I actually had two this week. And one of them is just purely an ego stroke, but but I liked it, <laughs> which was, that was one of the best half hours I've spent in a very long time. And that was from M uh, after watching my uh, traditional pocket knife collection video. So thank you, M. I really appreciate that. That put massive major wind in my sails. And then another comment, um, which is one of my favorites for a different reason, uh, from a Lacey Lace. And uh, she says, great episode, but this was hard to watch. I don't want to be rude, so I won't say why, but anyone that watches it knows exactly what I'm talking about. I watched the whole thing, but there was def a lot of head shakes. And this was on the James Williams interview uh, two weeks back. That's episode 342. And the reason uh, this comment struck me is that uh, I've, I've been um, either actively in the martial arts world or martial arts adjacent for many years. And uh, it's such a polarized environment and, and a, a, a debateful environment. I don't think that's a word, but it is now. And uh, this, I'm not exactly sure what Lacey Lace is talking about, but James Williams, after an entire uh, year and uh, uh, lifetime and career in the martial arts, has some very... Um, <clears throat> well, let's say very firm opinions about things through his own knowledge. And I'm wondering if this makes Lacey Lace bristle because she's a martial artist and, and uh, you know, maybe she thinks he's closed minded about things or something. So I don't know, just interesting, but just points out how uh, even communities like, you know, the knife community or the martial arts community, two different, two very different places, but how they can really get polarized, even under the love, under the shared love and passion of, of of a thing like knives or martial arts in this case pardon me so thank you one and all for watching and for commenting uh, i'm always interested in what you have to say especially when kept civil and you know what everyone keeps it civil it's it's always very nice even detractors keep it civil which i appreciate all right so let's get to a pocket check Okay, today I went into the vault and got out my uh, first best knife ever. Uh, this was my Zero Tolerance 0452CF. And what I mean by that is when I got this, this was the first time I spent, uh, well, let's just say ZT money. And the first time I got a Sinkovich design. And this is my favorite of the Sinkovich de designs. I, I love everything he makes. He makes a really beautiful uh, wine key you have to check out. Uh, but yeah, all of his designs are beautiful. But this one has always struck me. And there are uh, variations in the zero tolerance lineup of this design. Uh, smaller or way more exotic in build and materials. Uh, but yeah, this was my first knife with C uh, carbon fiber. And when I first got it, I liked it. And then after a while, the, the, the pattern started to wear on me. Uh, I would love to get another scale for this someday because I, I feel like this knife deserves deserves a different scale. Then again, it is the 0452 CF, so uh, it would be weird to have CF without it. I love the ergonomics of this knife. It fits in the hand uh, just so nicely. That's a four and uh, four point one to four and a 
an eighth inch blade. <laughs> uh, you got cutting edge all the way up to the handle. So that's a full cutting edge with the way the flipper and that choil are uh, created. And then just forward of the handle on the thumb side, you have this jimping up here, which is just feels perfect. It's perfect for that uh, thumb, thumb on the spine of the blade uh, sort of grip, otherwise known as the Filipino grip. Uh, just a great knife. This is one that I've always felt could benefit from a uh, shallower uh, edge angle. It is sharp, of course, and I've gotten it sharper than it came, but I, I've always felt like it just needs to be, it's a little steep right now. It needs to be brought back a little. Um, so maybe someday I'll, I'll go to the trouble, uh, but I carry it not as often anymore. So I don't think of it. Uh, zero tolerance, 0452 CF. Next up, uh, kind of been in my pocket ever since I got it. The Jack Wolf Knives Canine Jack. This is the dog leg. We're going to talk about this a little while later when we go over patterns. Now, mind you, uh, this is going to be a survey of patterns coming up. Not really uh, too much going deep into them because I have 20 to show how I tend to talk. So, oh, look at this. This was totally unintended and unnoticed until right now. Uh, but today I had two carbon fiber handles on me. That is a very rare thing. I uh, love this dog leg canine jack because it is a single bladed knife. So you get the full benefit of the ergonomics uh, of that curve. And what I mean by that is if you have uh, the spine and the, the spine contour of another blade popping out of the handle, um, you don't get the full effect of the ergonomics. Uh, you get the spine of the other blade on that belly side. So just that dog leg curve really fits, uh, fits and nestles in the hand perfectly for, uh, you could use this thing, you know, somewhat hard uh, or as you would any other uh, tough slip joint. I mean, these things are built like tanks, by the way, the, uh, uh, the, the Jack Wolf knives. We talk a lot about how refined they are with the full height hollow grind uh, on that M390 blade and the Beautiful refined design by Ben Belkin, who who takes traditional designs and tweaks them uh, to his liking through years of experience. But we don't talk uh, often about how these are built like tanks. <laughs> you have an integral spine and bolt. Uh, you have an integral liner and bolster, meaning the bolster is not soldered to the liner like on many traditional knives. It's all one piece with that uh, groove cut out for the cover here. And then you have two screws holding the cover in and then sort of a, a, a very custom style screw setup where it's under the covers. Uh, very rigid, very tough uh, knives, you know, as slip joints go with incredible a walk and talk and pretty strong springs. Uh, I would put that at a on my totally arbitrary one to ten pull scale. I would put that at a an eight or a seven and a half. <laughs> seven and three eighths perhaps. Okay. Next up, um, in my waist, uh, this is, I, I haven't carried this one in a little while cause I've been, um, I've been carrying my, my hog tooth a lot, the hog tooth tonto, but today my, uh, my other favorite carry fixed blade, the voodoo, the, the, uh, Kramer custom knives voodoo, such a thin package here. Um, oh, I love this knife. I, I really have to get around <laughs> to buying more of his work and having to make me a couple of others. He's got some incredible models that I really love, but this is the chief among them to me, uh, this voodoo. He calls it a Persian. I call it a clip point. I had him sharpen the clip point on this one that he made for me after, uh, uh, after he came on the show here. Uh, Eric Kramer, really awesome dude, making just incredible carry knives for um, military and law enforcement. Uh, he was, he's former military. And when he first started making knives, he was making these big Rambo knives, these big, awesome, aggressive, uh, the kind of thing you want to see in a movie, uh, and giving them to his friends who were deployed. And they're like, these are awesome knives, but it's just too heavy to carry with all the other stuff I got to carry, you know? So he started making them smaller and thinner and lighter. And, uh, you know, these are little, little last ditch uh, weapons here. These are not for prying open crates. And uh, yeah, you could open your MRE with this very thinly ground, hollow ground 154 CM blade, uh, but you wouldn't want to. This is something that might come out, uh, you know, in a, in a scrap. And uh, 
I love it. I love it. It carries so nicely. It's so beautifully made. And uh, and it matters to me that I really like the man who made it. You know, that's uh, that's something I've learned through doing this podcast. I had heard people in the past talk about relationships with custom knife makers. And um, I, I see what that is. That's I think it's cool. All right. And last up, my uh, my my ESK today, my emotional support knife was the Microtech Troodon. Uh, I can carry this now. Uh, it's a little stiff, uh, but, and it's got the the ring. Listen to this. You hear that? Bing, bing. Anyway, had this on me today. Um, not, not exactly sure if it's 100% legal uh, because of that secondary edge on top. Uh, but, you know, who, I, I don't know. These are murky waters we're swimming in. Uh, I just know that out the fronts are legal now here. And, uh, you know, the rest of it is kind of like, I don't plan on getting any, um, altercations with cops, but you never know. You never know. I guess I would toss this out the window and then drive back and find it. Uh, so this emotional support knife, uh, was on me all day and probably drove everyone around me nuts because it was a somewhat, I don't want to say tense day, but an active day. And I know I found myself doing that a couple times. So this was my carry today. Uh, what did you have? Uh, drop it in the comments below. Let me know. I love hearing what you guys carry, what you guys and gals carry. Uh, like I always say, it gives me ideas, gives me dangerous and expensive ideas. So let me know down below. Uh, I just got back from a visit to Hogtooth Knives up in, um, well, in the mountains of Massachusetts. It was out there. Uh, you've seen Matt Chase. He's been on the show a number of times. Uh, Hogtooth Knives, a uh, gentleman made my my 50th birthday knife. He made the Tonto I carry on my waist a lot and just a great guy overall. Well, my my father uh, commissioned two knives for my mother for their 57th anniversary. And uh, sorry, dad, if I got that wrong, uh, 57th anniversary. And so we went up there. I mean, they've they've had a lot of travel in their lives. They've had a they've done a lot of cool things. Uh, they they've never been like uh too acquisitive they've been more like let's go and experience stuff uh, which is cool so this was an experience for her she thought she was going to her old hometown up there uh but we ended up at a ford she's like where are we? we're on a dirt road now where are we what are we doing and um we show up matt chase walks out hey how you doing we walk in there she got she understood what it was and man she had such a ball my my mother makes jewelry so she loves tools my dad got her an ultimate set of screwdrivers one year and she was so excited. And all of her friends were like, what, what your husband got you screwdrivers. Uh, so, you know, that's my mom. She loves tools. So, uh, he toured her around it showed her the, the big presses and the big hammers and all, man, it was awesome. It was so cool. His shop is beautiful too. He's a very talented, uh, Smith. And I did happen to order a birthday knife from him. It's not a forged one. It's from his, uh, it's from his uh, production line. And I'm excited to show that off when it comes. Uh, but yeah, we had a wonderful time. Uh, so let me show you the kitchen knives that he made. This is the pairing knife. Look at that. Uh, that's 15 N20 and uh, 1095 uh, uh, Damascus, which he explained how he made that incredible pattern. And then that uh, that wood is uh, he, it's a purple and blue uh, Buckeye burl wood, uh, you know, stabilized burl wood. And I found out how it's stabilized. He explained it to me. It's put in a vacuum. The wood is put in a vacuum and all of the voids and all of the pores and veins are filled uh, with a vacuum. The vacuum pulls the uh, dyed epoxy up through all the voids i didn't understand how that worked but very cool beautiful knives my mom was very very happy and my dad was very very proud that he came up with this really cool gift and a uh, great experience and it was a good family bonding experience the only one missing was my my brother uh but we had a great time up there with my sister and my, my mom and dad and uh, i gotta say uh thanks to uh, Matt Chase for hosting us and Hogtooth Knives. And uh, as we parted ways and shook hands, uh, I invited myself back and said, uh, you got to teach me how to forge a knife. And he said, yeah, yeah, come on up, man, anytime. So sometime I'm going back up there and I'm going to learn how to forge a knife. Uh, this has got to be a part of my life at some point. Uh, right now, practically speaking, living in uh, uh, 
mega suburbia, not quite an option yet, but I have to forge knives at some point in my life. So going to do it. All right. Uh, next up on Junkie Podcast, we're going to take a look at uh, a new Kaiser and we're going to talk about who knives for a minute. And then we're going to have a, a state of the collection fest. Um, but first, if you like what we do here and you want to help support the show, please go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and check out the three tiers of support and the exclusive stuff you get and uh, the giveaways you are entered into, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I really appreciate the patrons out there um, for helping support the show. Uh, so does Jim. I also just appre appreciate all of you for spending the time here uh so quickest way to do that is go to the knife junkie.com slash patreon i will repeat that long and complicated address that's the knife junkie.com slash patreon if you're a knife junkie you're always in the market for a new knife and we've got you covered for the latest weekly knife deals be sure to visit the knife junkie.com slash knives through our special affiliate relationships we bring you weekly knife specials on your favorite knives Help support the show and save money on a new knife. Shop at theknifejunkie.com slash knives. That's theknifejunkie.com slash knives. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. I've been talking a lot about Kaiser knives on the show here uh, as I've been sort of reacquiring. I had a batch of Kaisers early with the Dorado and the Matt Cucciara days, beautiful titanium things, got rid of those. And But recently I've been reacquiring them, the Vanguard series I've been loving. Uh, if you're familiar with them, they have a thing they call the, the uh, Friday Knife Club. And um, it's the Kaiser Friday. What, what they do is they take a... Um, one of their Vanguard edition knives and they fancy it up a bit. And in this case, uh, you make sort of an exclusive about it uh, on this. In this case, they take the urban Bowie uh, by Dirk Pinkerton, little tiny sub three inch Bowie. It's a little charmer. Uh, they take this thing and instead of G10 handle scales, they're putting on eb ebony with carvings in it and i think it's cool and and they're boasting the facts that they have this uh, sort of wax that they put on it uh to stop the ebony from uh, i'm assuming it's already stabilized or maybe you can't stabilize ebony i don't know it's so hard uh and dense but anyway they have a wax that they put on it to uh, sort of treat it so it is somewhat impervious to the elements or as impervious as it can be but look at how i think this is cool i think the urban bowie is kind of a cool little knife anyway i do not own it you know yet i love prinkerton designs i love bowies and this little pocket chunker looks cool but with the ebony uh it just adds something special so go out there take a look uh at the uh kaiser friday knife club uh for the for the ebony treatment here on the uh urban bowie by dirk pinkerton cool little pocket chunker as uh as our good friend jimmy slash would say uh, next up, Who Knives, H-O-O, uh, -O, Who Knives, a uh, great little company out of Great Britain, a uh, gentleman who was a big fan of the knife world and a, and a big, you know, knife collector, but, um, you know, uh, what do you want to say, victim of the knife laws over there, victim, that sounds, a, um, you know, he was working within the, the constraints of his uh, knife laws over in the UK, designed some knives that have the aesthetics and some of the appeal and function of uh, locking knives, but made them into these really cool double detent knives. Anyway, who knives due to financial constraints and pressures has to go on hiatus for a while, which is, which is, I hate that news only because I hate hearing anyone uh, having to stop production. Even when I see a new restaurant go up and down, um, uh, it bums me out because people put their, their, uh, blood, sweat, and tears in this. Not only that, but look at these new designs that were uh, going to be coming from Who Knives. Very, very cool. Uh, these are, again, double detent, so non-locking, but just a little bit sturdier, a little bit beefier, uh, you know, uh, even further emulating some of the, the design cues of a modern locking tactical uh, folder. So I'm sorry to hear this, uh, that Carl Pearson uh, of Who Knives has to do this, but you got to do what you got to do. And we will keep our eyes peeled uh, because this is a lot of potential and he's already started 
and has gotten knives out there and he will honor warranty work and, and all of that. But uh, uh, Mr. Pearson, we look to we'll look forward to seeing who knives return and uh, and uh, your further success. All righty. Uh, coming up, let's take a look at the uh, at the state of the collection and then a survey where I, I got to keep my mouth moving for this. A survey of slip joint patterns coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Okay, so you may have seen my unboxing video this past week of a new Finch knife. And this was a out of the blue, um, hey, check this out, from Spencer and Steve over at finch knives and man i am grateful thank you gentlemen so much they sent this over for me to check out this is their new buffalo tooth knife and i am smitten let me wipe the blade down first though uh, i'm smitten with this knife okay so we know uh finch's usp finch knives is all about making modern flippers in with modern techniques uh but taking design cues from slip joints and the traditional knife world and putting them in this modern context. I love it. We've had, we've had them on the show. We've had Spencer on a couple of times and Spencer and Steve, uh, we had them on for, uh, the birthday bash and, uh, it was great talking with them and finding out where they come up with the design ideas. They're both outdoorsmen and they both have attachments to the past through their, uh, families, fathers, grandfathers, and these slip joint knives. So I love how they honor the past, um, but also honor the present and, and all of the innovations that have come forward. So the Buffalo Tooth is their take on the elephant toenail uh, style knife like this. Uh, big, broad blade, fat handled uh, work knives. Uh, I've heard it said that these were used on boats you would put it on top of a big rope and then hit the top of it with a mallet. But then I heard that that was hogwash. And actually, these these knives, these toenail knives were uh, elephants, toenail knives were favored by traveling salesmen in the Midwest, like during the 30s and 40s, something weird like that. So whatever the truth is, the elephant's toenail is a very. Um, uh, what do you want to say? Um it's one of those designs that really sticks out and sticks in people's minds. You know, there are some designs that are super small or super big, or this one happens to be super wide and broad. And I have to say that they really interpreted that traditional knife in a modern flipper so well. This works. This works in a design way so well. It feels great in hand. I mean, you have... A, of all the French knives, um, I'm not going to say this is my favorite. I think the Holiday is still my favorite. But of all the French knives, this feels the best in hand. This just, you grip this, and I, I swear you can do a lot of work with this. It's got a an inch and a half, almost inch and a half broad blade with a very tall, flat grind, thin blade. So, I mean, it is really wicked slicey on my unboxing video you saw me cut paper and make little tight waves with it you know just kind of cutting back and forth it is a razor blade this one has coca bolo wood it also comes in bone and a jigged uh steel handle this is a steel frame lock I believe that's a titanium clip uh you got uh, bearings in there and i love the old uh, nail nicks on there even though you don't need them if you feel like opening it with the nail nick, you got it on both sides. And actually, you need it. You need that nail nick to pinch this open because the detent is tuned for the flipper. I love a bolster lock. Did I mention it's a bolster lock? Or did I call it a frame lock? I probably just rattled off frame lock. This is a bolster lock. And I love the fluting. That is a, a touch that uh, traditional knife guys love, that fluting in the bolsters. So nicely done, and thank you so much, uh, Steve and Spencer, for sending this to me. Uh, I I will treasure it, and it will be a, a, a great part of my flock, of my nest of Finch knives. All right, so that is the state of the collection this week. Speaking of slip joint knives and slip joint patterns, let's talk 
for a minute or 30 about slip joint patterns. There are a lot of them. So when this came in, I thought I pulled out my other elephant toenails. I got a few of them and uh, I, it occurred to me that there are like so many different patterns and we, th we tend to think of maybe the top five patterns, but there are a lot of them. And I realized as I gathered 20 of them together that there are more that I am missing. So uh, feel free to leave comments uh, of ones that I should get to fill up my, to fill up my collection. But uh, here are, um, here are some very common slip joint uh, patterns. Now, these are all coming from case knives, Great Eastern Cutlery knives, and um, uh, Rough Rider. With a couple, with, uh, I got a Boker in there, and I have an old electrician's knife in there. Oh, spoiler alert. Okay, so one concept I want to get to first is uh, variation. Uh, variation meaning the first knife I'm going to show you is a trapper. The traditional trapper has a three and a quarter inch blade here and uh, main main blade clip point and then a spay blade for spaying animals. Look at that long, straight, menacing blade. So as soon as I realized what spay meant, I was like, oh, that kind of spay. Uh, that that innocuous looking blade has taken on a much more menacing, um, uh, menacing feel. Uh, this is a case it's the stainless steel i love you daddy white bone version uh but there the variation part is that this is also a trapper this massive great eastern cutlery based on the there you go uh based on the remington the giant remington folding hunter that that is one here is the improved trapper from great eastern cutlery where they put a worn cliff in there instead of a spay blade uh, here's a slimline trapper. It's a single bladed trapper. So trapper doesn't necessarily mean this setup with the clip point, the California clip point and the spay blade, but that's its most common, um, iteration. This, by the way, is a terrifying knife to shut. It's got these giant blades and it's uh, about a nine and a half. Uh, so it is a fingernail breaker. Uh, so first one is the trapper. I'm going to, I'm going to put this, I'm going to put this, I'm gonna, okay. So trapper is going over here. Next uh, concept actually I want to get to is, so the trapper is a jackknife. A jackknife is a knife that has uh, blades coming from the same pivot. Uh, so the same side, this has multiple blades coming from the same side. This is a jackknife. We also see single bladed knives being called jackknives, but uh, if you if you need to know what a, a multiple blade knife is, uh, all coming from one end, jackknife. Uh, here at, is a pen blade, and this is a congress. This is our second pattern. A congress is a pen blade, and that means it's got uh, blades coming from both sides. It's it blades pivot on both ends of the of the knife. So now I'm gonna put this down. We have pen knives. We have jack knives. And uh, this is a pen knife. This is a Congress. And I always thought, oh, Congress, it's like a fancy knife. It's what uh, congressmen use. I don't know why I, th I thought this, this had something to do with like statecraft. But no, it means Congress like coming together. So the blades, these usually have uh, four blades, three or four blades uh, on both sides coming together. I've seen Congress knives with six blades in them. Um, but yeah, that's Congress meaning like coming together, uh, not our political body. Uh, this one is a number uh, 62 with, this is unicorn bone, ivory, uh, unicorn ivory, um, Delrin or whatever it is, some sort of plastic, but they call it unicorn ivory. And when I got it, my daughters were shocked. I was like, yeah, this, they had to kill a unicorn to make this knife. And then of course I walked that back. Uh, but this one is a great Eastern cutlery. It's got the, the um, different style blades here, the pen knife, which is a spear point and the worn cliff. These will have multiple blade shapes and lengths on them. Um, and that's the Congress. Uh, next up is a Barlow. 
Now, the Barlow is a jackknife. Um, you will only ever see blades coming from uh, the bolster end on a Barlow. And what makes the Barlow a Barlow is that bolster. Uh, among other things, they usually are this uh, sleeve board shape. So they start a little bit uh, thinner on, on the pivot end and widen out towards the uh, tail end, the pommel. And uh, the bolster is what makes it because it travels one third of the length of the handle, roughly. So it's a very br uh, long bolster. And the, the point of that is that a long bolster gives, and, and then a longer tang gives more side to side um, stability when you're doing hard work with the Barlow. And the Barlow is a working man's knife uh, back in the day. And I don't know what day that is, uh, but back then and uh it was meant for hard use and it was a comp commoner's knife it was not a fancy thing that you put in your um in your vest it was a, a sturdier knife you dropped in your pocket and did work with this one is white bone this is a rough rider uh an older one i believe uh because it's an r-i-d-e-r -E as opposed to r-y right And it's got a very sharp, uh, but, you know, cheap steel blade. It's for, uh, 420, I believe, they use on these. And uh, it works works for me. I, I uh, love this little knife, got to say. I've got two of these Barlows. And uh, I love white bone also. So next, you know, we, have a, we have a case, we have a GEC, and we have a Rough Rider representing sort of three tiers of cost so far. There are, you're going to see four tiers of cost represented here. Uh, and we'll get to that shortly. Next up is the um, Stockman knife. Stockman. Now, here's another thing I, I was uh, kind of absent-minded about. I always thought Stockman. Oh, this is for a guy working in a warehouse. He's dealing. He's dealing in stocking shelves, and because that was my, you know, I did that when I was a, uh, you know, in in high school and uh, college at a at a paint store. So that's what I was thinking. But Stockman. This is a knife for cowboys, not for guys who work in paint warehouses, um, though you could use this very well. So the Stockman has a couple of blades on it uh, for a cowboy to use for work. You've got a large primary blade, which is a clip point, and then you've got a uh, sheep's foot, probably my uh, most used, even though there's a, more of a patina on this knife because I've cut, cut meat with it. and then. Since you're a cowboy, you'll probably have to spay something. Uh, so you got a little spay blade on there. This is the GEC number 66 calf roper, and it's a serpentine jack. So you can see how the frame is uh, uh, has that little curve in it. This is a great knife. I love this knife. I saw um, Rob Bixby's uh, version of this with Gabon Ebony. And uh, I searched for it. And then they, uh, I, I remember they re-released it in, what year was this? You can tell because they date them. This is 2017. They date them in the serial number here. Uh, so yeah, great, great knife. I love a Stockman. I need more because I, you know what? GEC has a new one. It's a, I'm going to have to look into that. They have a traditional Stockman out right now, which I need to get. And I think it's, it's on the, um, it's on the beer and sausage frame. I can't remember the numbers. My numbers are getting a little, uh, a, a little, uh, my GEC numbers. I'm just slipping with them because I haven't, I'm just kind of getting back into slip joints right now. Um, okay. Next up is the boy's knife. Now I have the 15 here. This is the great Eastern cutlery number 15. Um, the boy's knife is uh, a usually, well, it is a sleeve pattern sleeve board pattern uh, handle. That means it tapers from the smaller bolster, smaller than the uh, Barlow tapers, and looks like a sleeve board on an old fashioned ironing board. My grandma used to have one in her kitchen. Uh, you'd open up a cabinet, the ironing board folds down, and then there was a secondary board that came down that you could fit sleeves over so you could iron your sleeves. Um, so, uh, a length of, what is it? One, two, yeah, three and a half about, or three and a quarter in length. They do vary. The number 14 is a much smaller knife than this, and that is also a boy's knife. And uh, here is a, 
a boy's knife from this is the uh, little bro from um, Jack Wolf Knives. You can see uh, just about the same length. He put two bolsters on his. Uh, we'll talk about this another time. Uh, what a great knife this is, uh, representing another tier of of, uh, of cost. But the traditional uh, boy's knife has either a clip point or very frequently a very simple spear point like this and a single blade. Though my very favorite boy's knife, uh, which is not as uh, I iconic a style of boy's knife has a clip point and a spade blade it's kind of set up like a trapper um, and that's the one i show off probably the most on this show but uh so the boy's knife there it is a great pattern and and uh i've also shown off the um the store display of the little boy's knives uh, that uh, my brother got me uh, uh last year for my birthday very cool little thing it has all 12 knives still in it I'm, I'm sure it's worth something but i'm gonna keep it okay next up uh the swayback oh my goodness i love the swayback uh it first got its hooks into me with the gec number 47 the viper and then it re-established its hooks with the jack wolf knives laid back jack oh love this knife so now a swayback a swayback has a a uh, almost always has a war I'm sure there are exceptions to everything I'm going to say, but a worn cliff blade here, uh, and a handle that curves upward to fit the palm of the hand, especially for this sort of backward carving and peeling uh, hold. Um, but you can see on this Jack Wolf knife, uh, on this Jack Wolf knives version of the swayback Jack, the swayback curve is reduced, uh, reduced a little bit compared to uh, other designs of swayback, and I like that. It it makes it fit in the hand in the regular grip, the grip you're most likely going to use it in most. Uh, I I think it makes it fit in the hand better, uh, the way Ben redesigned it. Um, he does that with all of his uh, designs. He just tweaks them. Like I said, he's got a uh, he's got an amazing uh, collection of custom slip joints, and he draws inspiration from different ones and uh, comes up with the best version of the traditional uh, design uh, for him. And for it, it happens to be for me too. I love the way this feels in hand in this reverse grip for peeling and stuff. But I'm going to be holding it much more like this and. Uh, that reduced upward curve accommodates. Uh, so that is a swayback. A, a notable swayback uh, is the uh, case, swayback jack, a great little, uh, it's smaller than this, drop it in the bottom of the pocket, and um, it's a great, great little knife. Comes in either just the Warncliffe or you get the Warncliffe and the pen blade. All right, that is the swayback. Next up is the toothpick, sometimes uh, sometimes called the Texas toothpick. But saying Texas made me parched. Uh, I imagined the place where I got stopped by a, a cop out in the middle of Texas. It was desertous, and I thought this guy could kill me and leave me out here for the dogs and the birds, and no one would know. But he was very cool. All right, uh, here's the toothpick. This is a full size. This is the only place I can ever find a full size toothpick now is with Rough Rider. This is from their uh, Tobacco Bone, Tobacco Road series. And just a nice big full size. What is that? A four inch? One, two, three, four inch length uh, California clip point blade here on this toothpick. Fits in the hand really nicely. Uh, you've got a long, curved, horn-shaped handle. It looks like a steer's horn. And then a clip, long, slender clip point blade, sometimes called a Turkish clip point, sometimes called a California clip point. And I'm sure there, there are really fine points between the two of those that I don't get yet. Um, but it always has a long clip point, sometimes with a secondary descaler I've seen. Uh, a descaler and eye gouger outer. Uh, I think that's what that thing is on the end. Maybe it's for getting out hooks. Uh, but you'll see that a fishing version of this knife. Love the Texas toothpick. And uh, they mostly come mini. I have a, 
mini one. Oh, that's not here. That's in a, my wife has that one. Uh, but love the toothpick. And they always reminded me a little bit of Italian stilettos, just in their length and, and uh, kind of skinny menace, menacing nature. Next up is a classic, classic work knife. And again, you can find many variations of this, uh, but this is probably my favorite. Uh, this or the smaller version. This is the GEC Sodbuster. Uh, this is the Bull uh, Bull Buster. This is the larger one. They make the number 72, uh, which is the Bull Nose. And this is the number 21, the Bull Buster, a bigger, bigger version. This has a uh, one, two, three, and it's almost a three quarters, three and three quarters inch blade on a nice stout spring walk and talk on my totally arbitrary scale. I would put this at a seven and uh, that's, I think that's ideal. Seven, seven and a half is ideal. Uh, has a nice girthy um, contoured linen micarta handle here. This is from their work uh, field and farm series. Uh, so they it used to be that they had the field and farm series and they were less desirable. And you could you could after the release of a field and farm version, you, you had a couple of weeks at least to snap one up. Some of the less desirable models would would linger on websites for a long time. That just doesn't happen anymore with Great Eastern Cutlery. Whatever they release goes like immediately. Um, so I'm glad I have what I have because I don't have much patience and I'm not, you know, I'm just getting back into a slip joint mode. So a lot of cool slip joints have come out while I've been sort of out of the collecting mode and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But anyway, uh, this sod buster is, um, is known for it's like I said, sort of girthy and lengthy working handle, a little bit of a bird's beak at the end to keep it in your hand and uh, just nice and stout with a very large pivot. They always have large pivots. As a matter of fact, when you see the case bone sod buster, you'll see that they have very small pivots. And that's a, I think that's a bone of contention uh, with sod buster collectors because the, the pivot is supposed to be larger on a, on a sod buster. Uh, long drop point blade with a good straight section and then a good belly down towards the end of that drop point, just a very slight drop point. This reminds me actually of like an Essie or a Hungless, uh, Essie Hungless sort of blade, just sort of made small and in a folding version. Uh, you've got the nail neck there. This one had a patina and when I polished it off, it took the artwork off, but at certain angles you can see it says bull buster. I don't, I don't care for the billboarding on the blade. I know if I were a true collector of these, I'd leave them pristine, but you know, it's a work knife. So and you know how much I work, you know, out in the fields with my knives. So I, I got, I had to get this one dirty. Uh, good walk and talk. Let's listen. Not, not so dramatic on the sound, but a, a good walk and talk and a large, sturdy, single bladed uh, working slip joint knife. Next up, one that is near and dear to my heart. I have mm, a number of versions of them. And my very first knife, uh, which I've shown off a bunch here. Uh, was one of these, but I'm not going to show that one. I'm going to show another one from my grandpa of the same type. And this is the camp knife or the scout knife. And when I say scout, or when they say scout, they're referring more to like boy scout, not scout like I'm a scout. I'm out scouting around with a with with a big uh, tracker knife. It's one of these. So a multi-bladed knife, it's sort of um, uh, pre-Swiss Army knife, Swiss Army knife style knife they usually have four implements on them uh, a screwdriver cap lifter uh, a, a can opener this is an old-fashioned uh type of can opener uh, i tried it it works now i just can't remember how oh you, actually you just carve it you just push you just push and rock but it doesn't lock onto the side like the newer ones um and then it'll have a main blade usually a spear point uh, but if you get the GEC 99 camp knife, it'll have a big clip point blade. That is a very, very cool knife. And then an awl, probably the, I love the awl. And on my first camp knife, it was most definitely, I should say, the most used tool on it. You know, you want to make a bow and arrow, you're going to use that awl to, to, to make the holes. You want to, I, I, holes and belts. I just found myself as a kid using the awl all the time. Uh, you can get these in a bunch of different versions. 
Rough Rider has a version, a couple of versions right now that are good. However, beware on the Rough Rider versions. The cap lifter doesn't really lift caps. You got it, it looks like a cap lifter, but you have to do a little bit of filing to make it work. It doesn't quite fit on the lid as well as it should. I I've been able to make it work, but through very conscious manipulation. And you know, when you're trying to get into a beard, you want to have to do conscious manipulations, especially if it's beer number 12 or 13. Uh, so the camp knife, love this thing. Um, I love all of these versions, but I like this one with the old fake uh, bone. This is old. This is Delrin, jigged Delrin. Oh, and it says, this one says um, MDUSN. So I'm not sure if that means like Medical Corps, Uni uh, United States Navy, or, you know, I know it's pre-usual suspects network. <laughs> All right. So something that you saw uh, in my pocket check, this is the latest Jack Wolf knives, uh, knife. This is the August release. The beautiful dog leg Jack. Uh, we talked about this before, so I'll, I'll keep it brief. Uh, I do love that uh, uh, swell tip spear point. I love how it, it dro uh, drops the cutting edge angle, uh, so really accelerates a cut as you're pulling through. Uh, but the thing about this is those uh, are the ergonomics. That curved, shaped handle, the way it fits in hand, and the way Ben uh, tweaked that design, it just fits in hand perfectly. So that's the dog leg jack. I always thought that the dog leg jack before I had this one, I always thought it looked a little goofy. And I always thought, oh, they're just trying to be different. And different for different sake, what's the point? But then I got one in hand and, and thought, duh, Bob, you're so arrogant for thinking that, <laughs> you know, because of course there's a reason for it. And there's a reason why it stuck around. If there was no reason for it, it wouldn't have stuck around. It would have been just a novelty. Uh, but the dog leg jack is a very, very ergonomic handle. I just recommend that you get one that is single blade uh, so that you can really take advantage of those ergonomics. Um, next up is a Tony Bowes design and not so universal. Um, I've seen custom makers make it and then I've seen case knives and case Tony Bowes make it. This is a Carhartt edition of the case knives uh, back pocket. The back pocket knife is uh has a long slender california clip blade uh and a long and, and a nicely contoured and long handle with a lanyard hole and the case version comes with a with a little fob case knives um i love the idea of this knife uh i am not so much a back pocket carrier of the wallet um, but when I was, when I was an urban dweller and I was always on my feet walking around and not sitting, not sitting as much and not sitting in cars and stuff, I'd, I'd have my wallet in my back pocket and I would keep knives right next to it and they would stand up straight up and down next to the wallet. Well, I didn't have this then, but this would, this is perfect, uh, when I carry a wallet in my back pocket and then you slide this down next to it because it, it's the perfect length and then you have this little thing hanging out and, uh, of course, you got to be carry, uh, careful about pickpockets and such. Uh, but, you know, you've got this uh, or, or just walking by something and snagging. Like if you're walking in the woods, snagging on a bush or something, you got to be careful. But uh, perfect size and length for that kind of carry. That is a long blade. One, two, three and a half inches, a little bit skosh over three and a half. Uh, and this is the, the case stainless steel, surgical stainless steel. But you can get this in. If you can, actually, I don't think they make these anymore. You, you got to find these on the secondary market, but you can find them beautifully done with bone. The only problem is those, some of those don't have the lanyard hole. And to me, the lanyard hole is a big part of what I like about the back pocket knife designed by Tony Bowes. Okay, next up is the lady leg knife. Lady leg, you say? Uh, all of the girls in my house, uh, including my wife, have one of these by Rough Rider. And then my wife went and got a bunch of them for her, her female cousins. And so like everyone in the family has one of these. Um, mine is big because I'm a man. No, this was sent to me uh, by Mike Latham. Thank you, Mike. He, he knew I liked Rough Riders. And Mike Latham has a bunch of sweet, uh, you know, he, he doesn't need Rough Riders around. So he sent this and a number of others to me. And this is my, this is my sole lady leg. Uh, but I love that shape. Well, because, well, 
because it looks like a lady's leg and then it's got a high heel. Also looks a little bit like Italy. Uh, but I also love it with the, um, what is this, imitation tortoise shell. Uh, because the bolster really does look like a short boot, and this really does look like a leg. Uh, so I like that, and I love the saber ground clip point. You don't see too many saber ground um, uh, slip joints, but I like them. Uh, just, I don't know why. No, no no real reason. I just like the way they look. I'm being honest. And that's that's the whole thing about this knife, the way it looks. Yeah, it's a little goofy, and uh, but you can still open up uh, bottles with that, uh, with the with the late lady leg though i wouldn't because i'm not so confident that this wouldn't get marred with uh with excessive use okay so that was the lady leg um oh incidentally that was a knife that was carried by ladies uh in the early 20th century and uh so that's how that 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 didn't come about for for <laughs> for guys like me who like looking at ladies legs and boots uh it just was for ladies um and they've just sort of kept it around um they're usually much smaller uh my wife and daughters are all much smaller okay next up is another one that i recommend you really get in the single bladed versions uh of this style if you can to take advantage of the ergonomics and that is the gunstock jack and the gunstock jack has a handle that looks like a rifle, but a rifle stock there. Uh, you know, there's the cheek piece, and and uh, this looks like a cowboy gun handle, uh, co cowboy gun stock. But that, incidentally, leads to very, very nice ergonomics. That step up for the cheek piece, so to speak, is a... Uh, comfortable way of widening out the handle to give you a little bit more control. And on this Jack Wolf knives knife, uh, representing the fourth level of expense here, at you know this is the most expensive uh, of the of the knives here, the Jack Wolf knives, um, represents a certain sort of strength and uh, really usability of this in a in a in a harder way. Now you're not going to want to hard use the knife, hard use the knife, of course. Uh, but what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that the ergonomics on this will allow you to do more, especially right here. You have this area where your middle finger sort of sits in there and then your forefinger goes there. And he designed this with a curve there that I really like. And you can, this locks into the hand and you can take advantage of those ergonomics. Whereas with this knife that I really love, but uh, it has its issues, uh, the Great Eastern Cutlery number 44 has the gun stock setup, but it also has the secondary pen blade, which is an amazing blade, but it totally obscures the ergonomics of that gun stock shape. So that is why I recommend, um, if you can, I, I know there are a number of different gun stocks you can get in a single bladed version, like the one made by Fox that you can see uh, over at collectorknives.net or the Jack Wolf knives. Uh, this you'll have to get on the secondary market at this point. Uh, because these are all sold out. Awesome knife again, M390 blade steel, full height, hollow grind. Next up, the elephant's toenail I told you about before. We took a look at it when we looked at the Finch. I'll just show you real quick. This one uh, always has a master blade, and then it, and on the other side, a pen blade, is some sort of secondary blade. Uh, this is a big pen knife, and like I said, uh, it, it has a, a tradition that I've heard about, but then I've heard was disproved. I do not think that this is actually a maritime knife uh, used for malleting through big ropes. That would be cool. I think it sounds way cooler than a favorite knife for opening boxes by traveling salesmen. Uh, but we'll just we'll just put that one down here. Uh, very uh, known for the broad nature of the blades and the thick, broad nature of the handle that is the elephant's toenail it's getting crowded the field's getting crowded all right next up is the cotton sampler this is a cool one and i've only been able to find it i think gec made a run of it early on like in the early um, early mid 2000s uh this one is by rough rider and that, that's they're the only ones that you can readily go out and get a cotton sampler from i'm pretty sure um just a cool looking knife looks like a giant scalpel uh but it's 
the, it also looks kind of like a dinosaur. Uh, I, I will admit, I will say I, that might sound weird, but um, look at that. It also looks a bit like a spay blade at the tip. Anyway, this is for cutting cotton uh, buds off. And then this flat part here is for, I guess you put the cotton on one side and you press your thumb and you pull it through to test its quality. And that's as far as I know. Um, I, I don't know much about cotton farming. Well, I don't know the first thing about cotton farming. and But I did read somewhere that that's what that little space is for. And that's what the shape of this knife is for. I got it because it's very unique and just wanted to have one in my collection uh, to refer to uh, during moments just like this. Uh, so the cotton sampler, if you're interested, they have uh, Rough Rider has a couple of different uh, models. You can get it small. I have a I have a a wee little one. Uh, a wee little cotton sampler. You can get a cute little one, drop in your fifth pocket, or uh, or you can get a couple of these big ones. This one is in that uh, nice faux stag, uh, but the faux stag is still made out of bone, so at least it's somewhat. Uh, organic. Okay, so next up is a maritime knife. This is the Marlin Spike. This is truly a maritime knife. I know that for sure. Uh, most Marlin Spikes have a um, sheep's foot blade, though I've seen them with others, and um, on one side, and some of them now lock, uh, but, but on the traditional one, the sheep's foot blade does not lock. It's just on a slip joint spring. But then the locking side is the Marlin spike. Um, and on this one, you unlock it by pulling that down. What is the Marlin spike for? It's for um, vanquishing your foes. No, I'm just kidding. But you could definitely uh, use it as a weapon. But this is for getting out knots, really tight knots in rope and string. Uh, mostly rope because uh, it's a pretty thick thing but uh imagine you have a knotted rope uh and you have all of the all of the strength of the winds pulling against that knot say it's on a sail or something and then you have to undo that knot well you're going to be happy that your marlin spike that you use to wedge in the knots to to loosen everything up you're going to be glad that that thing is locked out because if that folds when you're pushing and all the pressure that's going to wrap on your knuckles and hurt like hell. Not only that, but it's going to just take you forever to undo the knot. So this is a rough rider Marlin spike with the white bone. I do like white smooth bone, as I've said, and uh, that is the Marlin spike. A lot of cool versions of that knife out there in the wild. Um, yeah. So check it out if you're interested. I, I think it'd be cool to dabble in making a tactical version of the Marlin spike. Next up, this is one given to me by my grandpa, and uh, this is uh, an electrician's knife. It says uh, Swift Electric Supply, Nanuet, New York. Uh, my grandfather and grandmother lived in, and my mom grew up in Rockland County, New York, right outside of New York uh, City. The um, electrician's knife usually have the wood handle, and they have the bail here, so you can put a lanyard on them or clip them to something. And then they have a big, sturdy spear point blade. Always have a bolster. Sturdy spear point blade. And then in liner lock fashion, they have a locking uh, screwdriver slash, uh, this is like for stripping wire, I think, and other, I'm sure many other uses that electricians know about. Uh, but there's the liner lock right there. It says, it says press. Let's see if we can get that focused. Ah, it says press right there. And so that's something you want to keep locked open. Again, like the Marlin spike on that very uh, specific use knife on the, on the Marlin spike, you want that thing open because you don't want to be horsing through some knot and then it folds. Ah, really hurt yourself. Okay, next up is the one arm knife. This is something that was developed after the Civil War when there were uh, the American Civil War when there are a lot of people wounded, missing arms, missing limbs, missing hands, uh, the one arm knife could be opened using the divot at the end of the sort of straight razor shaped blade to open up on your pants or open up on uh, the side of a table or whatever you're, wherever you are, that little hook on the end, similar to a straight razor can be used to open it up. This is a Rough Rider with uh, jigged honeybone 
and a bolster that is much like a uh, long, kind of like a Barlow bolster and a lock. It's a cool little knife. Um, this would be a great little utility knife just to carry around with you. It's, it's the lack of a point makes it less menacing. Then again, maybe the way it looks like a straight razor might make it <laughs> might make up for the menace. Not sure, but that's the one arm knife with the notch at the end so that you can open it up with one hand against something. Okay. Penultimate design here is the large folding hunter. And a, a number of companies have made these. Uh, this is a boker. And this is with jigged bone, beautiful, beautiful jigged bone. This is a very nice knife. I got this on the secondary market. Actually came with a great little pen blade the guy threw in there. Um, but these are large, uh, what do they measure in at? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five inches closed. So that's probably about a four inch blade. You get two blades on these. This is a large jackknife. And that clip point blade, which is... Yeah, four inches long is um, the main blade. Let me try and hold this still. Large clip point blade. Very beautiful. This one had an etching in it uh, that was gone by the time I got this or very, very muted. You got the double bolsters and then you have a secondary blade for skinning. Or who knows, maybe that's your primary blade if this is your hunting knife. Um, again, that 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 tall peaked clip point blade um, folded up in the handle totally obscures the ergonomics of this handle. Um, so you're, you are feeling the blade here, even though it looks like that must feel very comfortable. And the only way to truly feel how comfortable it is, is to open up both blades and you're, you're not going to be doing that here. I'll, I'll leave open the, I'll leave open the skinning blade. So that is the large folding hunter. And uh, like I said, case makes these, a uh, bunch of different companies makes these. They are classics. I love them. I'm glad I have that one in my collection. And it came with a really nice leather thing, uh, slip holster. Okay, last up is a jackknife. It's a very famous pattern, and it is just simply adorable. That is the peanut. Here is the peanut. Peanut, that's what we called uh, uh, my first daughter when she was in utero, because that's what she looked like. She looked like a peanut. This is a tiny little knife, a uh, very famous pattern by Case. Uh, this one is in their, um, in their carbon steel. And uh, I love their high carbon steel, uh, their CV, chrome vanadium steel. They seem to spend special attention, pay special attention to the, to the knives they make with the CV steel. Um, and this is no exception. It feels great in hand. It's very, very sturdy. And that that blade steel, that CV blade steel just gets incredibly sharp. This one is uh, of the pocket worn series. So it looks like you've been carrying it in your pocket for years, but a peanut has a main clip point and a small pen blade. These happen to be extremely sharp. This is a great, great little drop in the bottom of the pocket. And it's probably all you need kind of knife. All right. I'm going to leave it there. Like I said, there are more, and I don't think I have them. <laughs> I went through uh, looking far and wide through my uh, through my collection, and this is the most that I could come up with. And I find it very interesting. I'd like to, at some point, broaden this into peasant knives. You know, your open L's and uh, and your uh, what are, what's the Le Ducs and and the the peasant knives from different countries. I think are very interesting, also. All right. Well, thank you for coming on this uh, this little trip down uh, down slip joint lane. I love it. I love these patterns. Don't forget what a jackknife is, what a pen knife is, and don't forget don't forget about slip joint knives. If you're not into them, if you're just into folders, if you're just into moderns, uh, check them out. Drop one in your pocket. Put it in a little slip, and and see how useful it is. And and you might grow attached. Um, so. I don't know. Check it out. Word to the wise. All right. Thanks for joining me again. Uh, download us right here on the podcast apps and check out the Sunday show uh, when we always have a great interview with someone interesting from the knife world. All right. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer.
Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.